Right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Network Dead. My name's Jane Secker. I'm from the Centre for Learning Technology. Uh, Network Dead is our uh, seminar series, which we record and live stream. So welcome to people joining us online or watching the recording. And welcome to everybody here in the room this afternoon. Um, very pleased to welcome Mark Wells, who's from um, Imperial College Business School. Um, he's going to be speaking to us um, about uh, an alternative uh, way of uh, delivering uh, sort of learning and, and uh, course materials to students. So the title of the talk, uh, Innovation via Thin VLE, um, is perhaps a little, in some ways, uh, cryptic, Mark, might you say? Um, it's, actually, it's actually the title of um, the presentation that Mark was just telling me he gave at the Asolite Conference, which is the Australian Society for Computers in Learning in Tertiary Education. So until Monday, Mark was actually in Sydney, in Australia, uh, and he presented at this conference there. Um, he's a, a senior learning technologist. Um, and he supports the use of learning technologies on their undergraduate programs. Um, he's also uh, um, got an MSc in e-learning, multimedia and consultancy from Sheffield Callum, a PG Cert, and uh, he's also a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. So we're, we're really pleased to have Mark here this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I think he's going to give us a demo as well of uh, the, the system, the hub that they're using at Imperial. And we're looking forward to um, the, the talk. So Thank thanks you. Thanks very much. Cheers. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't need to introduce myself now after that. That was very detailed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is an adapted presentation from the one I gave at Asolite. Um, the main difference is the title. Um, it was actually called Innovation via a Thin LMS, which is a learning management system, um, which is what everyone apart from in the UK uses as a term for VLE which is a virtual learning environment. So the only change I've really made is changing thin LMS to thin VLE. Everything else is going to run pretty much the same. My plan is to break it into three sections. Firstly, I'm going to give you some context to what, what brought about this project. Then I'm going to give you a live demonstration from a student's perspective and from a faculty perspective. And then I've got some discussion points and hopefully people will have questions and, um, and that will wrap it up. So if you want to um, see the full paper, um, it's a published paper, you can grab that via the Asolite website, as to you can grab the slides as well. So first I'll start with a, de a definition of what we mean by um, a thin uh, VLE. Uh, we say it's defined as a learning management system that prim primarily seeks to integrate um, data from external sources and software from external sources. And that really is in contrast to what we describe as a monolithic VLE, which is your Blackboard or your, your Moodle. Uh, we call those monolithic VLEs, uh, which seek to contain all that data and, and software within their environment. Um, and that's the main difference um, between a thin VLE and your traditional uh, VLE. So to give a bit of a college context, um, we're the business school. We're just one department within Imperial College, um, of which there are, there are five departments. And currently, we, we offer 15 MSc programs, uh, that's postgraduate and, um, and two undergraduate programs. Uh, we have an MBA suite, we have management, innovation, all the things you'd expect from um, a management uh, and business school. Uh, and we, we currently serve around 2,000 students per year. Um, and most of our programs are one year long, uh, with exception of our uh, MBA suite when we have a part-time and a weekend um, version. Um, so this is how our programs are actually um, organized. So a student uh, arrives and says, yeah, I want to do the full-time MBA program. And this is how it's organized. So they have the program, they have their terms, and then within their terms they have their core courses, and they have electives. But when a student arrives at Imperial College uh, Business School, they're in a bubble around their program predominantly. And, and so that's um, what I've tried to illustrate here, apart from shared electives. Um, so just a bit about the project. So the, the FinVLE um, we've developed is called The Hub, and it's designed around one of these programs. So traditionally, your, your Moodles and your, your Blackboard, you, you log in and you have a list of courses, but you don't really have this idea or concept of a program. Our students feel like they're part of a program and they have a collection of courses within that program. So our, our um, hub is developed around that. And it was first developed back in 2011-12. Um, 
and since then it's been enhanced each year based on feedback from faculty and students. So just to give you a bit more detail about what's happened in those iterations, back in 2011-12 um, when we first developed it, it was developed for just one program and it had a very tight remit and it wasn't ever really supposed to be a version 2 or a version 3. The, the idea was um, we had a new program called Strategic Marketing and it was going to be launched and it was around the same time like the first iPad. Then program director thought, that's a marketing idea, let's give all our students iPads and we were like, yep, that's great, um, but we need something to serve all the electronic content up on. And at that time, at the business school, we were using a very old version of Blackboard called WebCT, and it just wouldn't work on the iPad. You logged in, you got a, a black screen, it wasn't very good. So we're like, okay, we've ordered the iPads and now we need something to serve it up on. So we got, the, we got some permission to say, for this program, you don't have to use the institutional VLE, you can create your own bespoke area. Um, and this is what we did, and it was developed in-house by myself, and the focus was really around communication. So the idea was that given these iPads, they're going to be going out there, finding things, and then sharing them back with the community. So that was the original remit, and um, that went really well. It went so well that um, at the end of the first year, we got really good feedback from faculty and from students, and this started to spread by word of mouth, and then 10 other programs said, we don't want to use the institutional VLE either, we want to use the hub. Um, and we were like, okay, that's difficult. It was designed by me, it's not very scalable. Um, so we needed to then go back and rethink it and think how can we, how can we scale this up. We got some funding and we managed to develop it with some third party people. So we got a development team from Shoreditch and we got, uh, sorry, a design team from Shoreditch and some developers from the North. Um, <laughs> and they actually developed it and upscaled it for us. And we changed our focus not just from communication but also to integrate. And this is the idea of the Thin VLE came, came about, it's integrating with all different um, tools and technologies. But we were still, in the second year, still using um, Blackboard for assignment submission. So we, com we didn't completely abandon the VLE, um, but we almost did. Um, and then in the third year, um, all the programs in the business school moved to the hub. No one was using the institutional VLE, and we also started to use the hub for assignment submission. So we stopped using the um, institutionally supported VLE completely. Um, it was never the plan, it just kind of happened like that. And, and when we refer to middleware solution, um, it's this idea that we integrate with the college systems and best-in-class technologies. And here are just a few examples, and I'll just run through these. So we have a central um, student record system, um, I think it's called CCAT or something like that, and that's where all the students are on um, their results. Um, and we pull from that, so that when, you log, when a student logs into the hub, it goes and grabs their, their details and it displays them to the student. We have social media integration, so anything that's sh that happens within the hub is, is shared via um, social networking onto different mediums, which allows our students to have more than one route into their learning content. They don't just have to come to the, the, uh, the hub, they can redirect via other mediums. Uh, we have an email server in integration, which sounds quite simple, but it's quite effective. So this allows our faculty to just create an email. They email it to the hub at imperial.ac.uk. It knows what they're teaching on and it just posts it onto the hub. So it makes it very quick and easy for our faculty to engage with our students. Similarly, students can get notifications of new content, they can reply to it, and they can have the exchange by email, but everything gets pushed through to the hub so that everyone gets the benefit of the message. So these one-to-one -one conversations can, can become more widely accessible. Uh, we use cloud-based cloud, uh, cloud server, um, and we use Dropbox. And this is this idea of best-in-class technology. So um, most of our faculty have got Dropbox accounts. Uh, they use it for their research when they're working with other institutions around the world. And we hooked into that, and we started using Dropbox for our course materials as well. So we have a centrally installed version of, of Dropbox called a business account. It's in, installed on an Imperial server, and it mirrors back to Dropbox. And basically, we, we create a folder for a course. We share that with a faculty member. Then the faculty member drag and drop their content at their desktop PC. It appears on the hub. They go down to class and teach. It allows our faculty to be much more flexible, much more dynamic, and they can bring in real-life examples drop it, go down to class and teach. That's been, that's been great. And that's seen that actually our faculty engagement has gone up from around 20% engagement, adding content to our institutional VLE to about 75-80% of faculty now actively engaged in adding their own materials, which is great. The next one is library integration. So we have a central library system, a commercial off-the-shelf piece of um, But it, it outputs a, a, an XML file and 
we, uh, we worked with a library team and we said, you know, can you create our reading list for each course? Give us this export file and we'll just import it directly into the hub. And they were like, yeah, we can do that. And it's worked so well that we've had maybe a 700% increase in digital resource usage in the business school in the last 12 months. So from a, from, from a library point of view, they've been really happy with that in, increase. I always say from our point of view, it means I shouldn't have read. And then lecture capture. Um, again, this is this idea of best-in-class technology. When we first launched the project, we used Echo 360, and we looked at their, X, uh, their RSS feed, and we integrated it into Hub. Last year, we made the decision to move to Panopto, and we, we, we just flipped from using that RSS to using uh, the, the Panopto RSS, and that feeds directly into the Hub. So that just shows you some of the ideas of, of integrating and best-in-class technologies. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a demonstration of how that actually works. And I'll, I'll do it from a student's perspective, so this is exactly how it will look to a student. And I'll try and talk you through where the content's actually coming from and how it gets served up on the page. And then I'll do it from a teaching perspective where I'll kind of show you um, how they actually add their content and also how we manage um, assignment submission via Dropbox as well. So... Is there any questions before I start? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more, before, unless it's part of the demonstration, about your social media integration, just because I found that the most interesting, because yep. that's the one where I would think, well, unless you're just pushing out notifications and you're not, you're not kind of um, suggesting that students should be using social media, how, how, should be yep. sharing. I can, I can share how, how it works. It works... Um, we have, um, we have a process at Imperial College. When students become uh, offer holders, we give them access to um, a Facebook group, which is a private group. We add all the students in there and they have their discussion. Then that carries through with their entire lifetime at Imperial. So once they become um, actual students, we then push all communication from the hub to this group so the students can see those messages. If they write a response on, on Facebook, it transfers it back onto the hub and it becomes a two-way relationship. But it's a private relationship. It is, but you are kind of suggesting that even those students might not have a Facebook account yet before they come, mm -hmm. they will have one. No, no, not, not, com not completely. It's, it's just this idea that you, you, you might want to access something by more than one medium. You know, you don't just have to come onto the hub to access your content. You can access it via email, via Twitter, via Facebook. There's so different ways. you can ways. opt out of Facebook. Yeah, of course, yeah. You okay. don't, it's not a prerequisite at all. Okay. If, that, if that came across, that is not the case. Although most of our students do have accounts, as most people in the world do. It's just an unfortunateness. So, um, this is, um, actually, before I say that, there is some more integration. It's one of the, the new features. I'll, I'll talk about that. It's quite cool. But I'll talk about it when I demonstrate. So, this is what the hub looks like when a student arrives at the home page. Um, this is actually just a, a, um, a version of WordPress. So, it's a word, I don't know if you, you know what WordPress is. It's just a commercially free um, CMS. And we use that as our platform. And then we've just built some plugins on top of it that create the hub. If you switch those plugins off, it goes back to being a basic WordPress installation. You switch them on, you get the hub. The first plugin is Active Directory um, login. So the students log in with their Imperial username and password, um, and they click login, which is what I'm going to do. And this is what it looks like when the students arrive at the home screen. They're, and this is this is just for one program. This is just for the, the management MSC. So if you're a student, if you're a student doing the management MSC, you log in. This is what you see. And the idea is uh, the home page is split into uh, three main areas. The first is the communication panel. And this works a little bit like, like Twitter or Facebook, and it's just um, um, the messages as, as they appear. So whenever faculty post a message, it appears on this. It's aggregated, but it could be from any of their courses. And then we have the idea on the right-hand side of their actual course list by their term. So right now, at Imperial, we're in the autumn term, and these are the courses that our students are studying in the autumn term. And then at the top, we have this, uh, the idea of the program level. So this is all course level content. At the program level, they can see forum activity across all their program. They can see program team messages, which might be information about um, staff student committee meetings, exams at a top level. So that's just how they um, give out information. And what you also have is a personalized environment. So when a student logs in, it goes to our central student information system. It says, what is this student studying on? It gets that feedback, and that's how it knows what to display to the student. And that's essentially held information. And also, it's personalized to the student when they last logged in. So I've not, since I last logged in, there's been four new posts in this course, and there's been eight new documents added. So if you're a student, you've not logged in to the Hub for a few days, when you log in, you can quickly see exactly what you can do, both at a content level and at a communication level. 
So it's quite useful for the students and, and it works quite well. And the idea um, around community of practice and discussion is whenever someone posts, a faculty member posts, students can hit uh, respond to post. And hopefully there will be some. So you've got one here about a lost mobile. But you've got this idea that the faculty member said, actually, someone left a uh, mobile in class. They should have went, it's mine. And then it finished. But this is just this idea that they push out the message. Everyone can see it. They can respond. And communication happens. But it's all captured inside the hub. Um, this is the only method that we use for communication. So this has kind of replaced email. And the idea is um, intentional. It means that this is a complete record of everything that happens on their program. It's completely searchable um, via the filter or by the search at the top. Everything's captured in this environment. So now I'm going to jump into, um, I'll jump into this course because there's some activity. And I'm just going to talk you through an actual course view and how this is built up automatically. Course. So this is the area where the faculty member will either be sending emails into the hub or logging into the hub themselves and going to uh, new and then new post. And this is the dynamic bit for the faculty to engage with their students. Then we have the course information area. And this is what, this course information is pulled directly from our central um, system. So we have this idea of a one true source of information. And that's a centrally held thing. We know exactly the aims of the course, the outcomes of the course, how it's going to be taught, because these are decided in advance of the course launching. And we also know exactly who's going to be teaching on it as well. So that all that information is automatically pulled through. So they don't have to go in and set that up and add that information. Then we have the, uh, the idea of the course materials. And this, um, this is where Dropbox comes in. So the first thing to say is, um, since I last logged in, you can see there's, uh, there's new documents that have been added. So if, as a student, I can see exactly what's been added that's new. And if a faculty member was to then make an update to that, instead of it saying new, it'll say updated and tell me when it was last updated. And this allows the faculty to, to make changes. The students always get the latest version. And what we do for this is this is all driven by Dropbox. So this course is actually um, BS0909. And if I go to Dropbox, this is now Dropbox installed on the Imperial server. And you can see all it is is just made up of loads and loads of folders with the course codes. And if I was to search for this course code, which is uh, this one on here, here it is. If I go into there, we have this idea of draft and published. Anything in draft doesn't appear on the hub, but it's really good for faculty to share when there's team teaching. Anything in published automatically publishes straight onto the hub. And if I go into the published folder, what you'll see is the files that appear here are exactly the same files that appear here. So it allows our faculty from their desktop just to drag and drop their files to engage with the hub. Very straightforward. Faculty love it. Yes, I, I think you need. Um, the, because of how, it, how it works is it we have a it's, it's a commercially available um, solution. You can you can decide if you want it to be mapped from your machine to theirs or from yours to theirs, and that we choose to do it. So it, first it gets mirrored to our server, and it's just projecting from our server to, to, to anyone that logs in. So we own all the content. We own the folder, we own the content. If we remove it, it removes it from everyone's view. And that's how we get around it. Um, the next one is the reading list. So this one comes directly from the, the, the library's reading list. Um, the library now are in control of this. If there's any new additions, any updates, they can do it from their PC in the library. It automatically live pushes the results. It's in this nice format. It's got the export to RefWorks functionality. And this is all built into this off-the-shelf solution. And wherever possible, uh, we've made um, versions electronic. And that's been a big commitment from us because we want it to be, uh, we don't give out paper to any of our students. Everything is served up via the hub electronically. So wherever possible, we want all our resources to be electronic. And obviously, our students want that as well. In fact, they find it quite frustrating when it's not available electronically and they actually have to go to the library. <clears throat> but we're working on that. Um, we're working more harder and harder to get chapters um, scanned and automatically popped in there. And this is improving all the time. And this has seen a massive increase. I said 700%. It's probably even higher than that right now. It, it, every time we release a new course and new resources go on there, it keeps going up. So it's great for us. And it's great for the library. We also have links to case studies too. Yes? Is there a copyright issue when you actually upload uh, scans onto the front? No, because uh, the library just pop a sheet on the front that explains exactly what the copyright 
allows them to do. So they look after all that. I have very, we, myself and the faculty have very little to do with that. We just put forward the reading list, the library do the, the rest, get all the irrelevant copyright, make sure everything's as it needs to be. Some of those resources, um, they disappear after a set amount of time and no longer accessible, but we make that explicit to students so that they know that's the situation. Um, the next one is the assessment area. Um, and this, uh, this, again, this outline comes directly from the, the central resource. And then we also have this new idea of assignment submission. And we decided um, to do this via uh, Dropbox as well. So you set up the assignment via the hub. So you have a cut and go new assignment. You give it a title, deadlines, whether it's individual or group. It sets up the submission. But that submission, uh, when it happens, it pushes it straight to Dropbox. So our faculty, they set their, their assignment up and then just have to wait for the assignments to come in from their desktop. And the students submit. If I go in, this is a submission for a team. It gives them the actual file that the students submitted and it also gives them a, a little report that tells them exactly uh, what, they, what the students submitted and when and who by and who, who it was on behalf of. So all that information gets captured and sent straight to the faculty member for them to grab the assignments. Um, and it's all enclosed in this, this Dropbox folder, so it works very well in our faculty. Uh, Sorry? It's not anonymous, though. No. Well, it's anonymous in as much as um, when we, uh, for our group work assignments, it, we don't have to worry about it being anonymized. Only our final exams, which are individual, are anonymized. And we don't do that via the hub. That's usually pen and paper in an exam room. Can't change everything overnight, I guess. Uh, the next one's lecture capture. So all of our lectures at Imperial are captured uh, via Panopto, and they are automatically uh, linked again via the course code and are uploaded directly onto the hub um, via an RSS feed. And the students can then just click and watch those back. Um, doesn't work. The next one is the class list. Again, this comes directly from the RSS, uh, from the um, central system. Uh, they know all the class and who's going to be teaching on it. And it pulls through the student's image as well. So it's quite useful for students and for faculty. Faculty can see who's in their class. Students can see who was in their class as well. And this automatically picks up the, the default image that the students have when they arrive at Imperial, which is usually the one that appears on their staff uh, student cards. None of the students like that, because it's usually quite a terrible picture. So we have this idea of a settings area where students can actually they can change their photo and add a new one, and they can add additional information about them, like their email, preferred email, um, telephone number, additional information that they can add. And students do do that on quite a regular basis in a sort of social aspect, um, mainly on our MSCs over our um, MBA program. But it's quite nice to see, and, uh, and it's, it's good to have the students actually taking an interest. And the last bit is um, every course has a forum area, and that's automatically created as well where students can ask questions uh, for peers and for our teaching assistants. So this is what a course looks like. And just to go through it, of these areas, this one's automatically generated, this one's automatically generated, this one is, this one is, this one is. So the faculty really have to concentrate on adding their materials and communicating with students. So if they, if they've, every time we create a course, 90% of it's already pre-populated, using this idea of integrating from, from college feeds. And then they just concentrate on, on their resources and their communications. And that's, it's working really well. We've had a massive engagement with it. And the faculty are now driving it. They're the ones that said that they wanted it. They're the ones that are using it. Um, and our students are benefiting from that, which is good. Yep. Uh, hey, I've got a uh, question from Twitter. Yep. Um, Martin Hawksey is asking, is the plugin list for the hub published anywhere? Also, has, anyone, has any of the developed code been made open source? Um, the answer to that is no at the moment. But the other answer is yes, we will. So right now, um, we, we haven't released anything that we've done, but we, we do plan to pop it back into the community. But what I would say, and this is one of the discussion points I'm going to pick up at the end, is it's very personalized to Imperial. So I'm not sure just how commercial it is, because it works so well, because it's very personalized to us. And um, I'm going to, I've got a slide where I'm going to talk about the fact that it's now development driven by faculty and students. Um, and that will further um, kind of confirm this idea that it's actually quite bespoke to Imperial. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. The other thing to say is, um, this, is the sh this is the web view. Um, we designed um, it to work on, it's, very, it's responsive. So we actually designed it initially for tablets. Um, when a student arrives at Imperial, everyone gets an iPad. So all students get an iPad. It's their iPad to keep, it's theirs to own. And we serve it up in this format by default. Um, obviously, we've got a mobile version as well, and we've got the full web version. 
And that was done um, because we, if we're going to go completely electronic, we need to know that our students can actually get those materials and get those in, that information. It's not quite ubiquitous yet where everyone arrives with a mobile device that can access this. So, so for the last two years, we've given out iPads. 2014-15, uh, at what point we think that mobile devices will be ubiquitous and we won't need to supply them anymore. Um, and we have seen that as a theme. Right now, uh, we gave out um, iPads in September. And a lot of students didn't open their iPads. They just popped them there ready to go onto eBay because they already had a device with them. <laughs> And that's fine. You know, we made that decision and that commitment to give them the devices. What they choose to do with them is up to them, as long as they arrive in class with a device that they can then access the materials and uh, interact um, is fine by us. So this is the bit that I was picking up on before, and that's the agile development. So the development now is driven by students and by faculty. So what we have is we have a, a working group that meet every other month, and um, we get student reps. We have a student rep in every program that's based on technology. They gather all the feedback from students on how we can enhance the hub, and they feed that in. And we have faculty representatives that tell us about how we can actually improve from a faculty perspective. And we, we gather that information, and then we, we actually then implement it. So we're quite agile in development, and we have a six-week turnaround. So those, those, those ideas come straight in. And that's why I don't think it would be commercially viable, because it's very specific to Imperial. Once you try and also factor in medicine or another university or the engineering department, before you know it, Everyone's going to have conflicting um, ideas about what they need. And then if, as soon as you start to do that, you have to become more general. And as soon as you become more general, you become a VLE, because you have to try and service everybody. And that's not what we want. So I don't think we'll ever go down that route. But don't quote me on that. You never know. Um, and a couple of examples of that is, one is faculty. Um, a couple of faculty members came forward with a really good idea. And what they said is, we get all the students' assignments in Dropbox. What we'd really like to do is, I write my feedback in Word. It's really good if I could just save that document drag it into Dropbox, and that feedback then go back to the students. And we're like, that's a really good idea. So that's now been implemented, and we're testing it right now. It'll be released in January for faculty who wish to do that can do that, which is great. And then we had another one from a student that was really keen um, on Twitter, and it was, uh, he wanted to actually... The idea of the newsfeed is still quite didactic. It's the idea of the faculty that push out the messages, but the students don't really have the ability to push out messages on the newsfeed. Um, he said it'd be really good if we could have a hashtag for each program and uh, implemented that into the newsfeed. And if I just choose that program, which is strategic marketing, you'll see that this is the regular newsfeed, but this is the new one where we've got, uh, we've got a hashtag for the program, which is uh, SMIBSC. And now whenever students uh, use that hashtag, it comes into the top of the newsfeed. And that allows the students then to actually feed in things that they find and information that they find that they think is useful for the students. And the student was so keen to do this that he actually then he ran a 101 Twitter session to all the students on, his, on the program and to faculty to get them involved in, and engaged in this. And it's working really well. And that's student driven. That's not something that we came up with. They came up with it. We implemented it. And it's now working. We're piloting it for the rest of this term. It works well. We'll roll it out against all, all of our programs. The students happy to run the 101 sessions for the programs as well. And, and I think that, for me, is, is kind of it's great to see that you know, they're driving development, not just us. Sorry, on that, can I just ask, it's, it's a little bit off, yep. but this is quite interesting. Um, I just saw the tweet as well, that so you've got a, a student, each, each course has a student each report, program. each program yep, that's for right, technology. Yeah. Yep. Um, we don't have that, do we? In a similar way that we have student reps that represent for um, But the specifically library. about technology, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right, So yeah. how difficult, and when, since when? That sounds quite interesting, and I think... Uh, uh, we have staff student committee meetings on each program that happen every other month. And the, the students report back. No, no, what I, what I mean is, like, since when have you had these reps for technology? Oh, That's since we started this project, really. So we had it in the first year. We had it because we wanted to. We didn't know exactly. We were basically just stabbing in the dark, trying to figure out how this would work. It worked really well. So then when the 10 programs came on, we said, actually, it'd be quite cool to get feedback from the other programs as well, from the students. It wasn't something that we planned, but it's something that we definitely benefit from. So. Yeah, thank you. So this is a little bit about next steps, and then I'll go into some discussion points. Um, next steps for us at the moment is based around a program and a course. That's all it's based around. And what we actually want to do is actually start to create more blended and online learning. So the idea is we're going to create a substructure. So we've got this idea of a program level, then we have the course, and then within the course we want to create this idea of, pay, of sessions. So you could have a session that's a fully online session, 
or a session that's a blended session. And that's the next thing that we're looking at. And as part of that, we want to have inline activities and inline um, assessments. So at the moment, you have to go to the assessment folder to do assessments. And actually, what, what people want to do is, as they're working through the material, when that assessment or that activity or that discussion needs to take place, let's pop it in line. And it starts to be more of a journey than actually going to one place for one thing and another place for another. And with a, a new program that we have, which is our online MBA program. Um, and the, the other aspect of that is learning analytics. And we want to actually start to, to, we have a lot of information, we gather a lot of information about what the students are doing when they're, they're on the hub, and they're on there a lot. Um, so we, we want to create an area where students can actually, they can see what other students are doing, they can see what the, the key resources are, which ones are the most used, and start to actually create an area where students can see a dashboard where they can see exactly what's happening um, across their program. And similarly, from a faculty point of view, to grab the stats that tell you, you know, these are the top resources that are being used. These are your most active students in the discussions. And, and also maybe start to badge and give students credit for these, where the faculties can actually dish that out. Um, and this is kind of in line with this idea of moving to more online and blended learning. And the last thing is a couple of discussion points. And these are from pros and some cons. So a pro for us is that we've definitely got a, 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 a greater degree of control over the user interface. We think it looks really good. Students think it looks really good, it looks polished, it's designed around a program, which is great. Um, we have close integration with uh, institutional systems. You know, if we switch all those things off, half of the course disappears, we switch them on, it all becomes live, um, which is great. We have this idea of adoption of best in class So just being able to put, integrate them and pull them in really quickly and really uh, an agile pace that makes it really useful for us. And the cost is very cheap. It's way cheaper than our uh, institutional VLE cost. Um, not only to set up and design, but our maintenance cost, which allows us to have this agile six-week turnaround of development, is, is, is peanuts. Um, but conversely, um, there's a lot of, of advanced learning features. Um, so we don't have things like adaptive release, which you have in your institutional VLEs. You know, you, you drag and drop, and it's, it's live or it's not live. Um, so you, there, are some, there are some things that you will lose, um, and you need to be aware of that. And then changing roles within IT services. So... Our institutional um, VLE is supported by a team of e-learning e people, and we don't really interface with them in the same way now. We work more with the server people that manage our hub server and our Dropbox server. So just negotiating new relationships is quite a challenge, a big challenge. And then scalability. I mean, how scalable really is this? It's working really good for the business school. We get feedback from students and from faculty. We seem to be really agile and responsive, and, and they love that. But could that work in other faculties of the business school, uh, in the Imperial College? I don't know, could it work at other institutions? I'm not sure. Um, so scalability, it might not really be that scalable. Uh, but it's working really well at the moment for us, and uh, we have nothing but good feedback. So at that point, I'd, I'd, if any, any questions, or if you want to look at anything closer, please let me know. Sorry, I know I've already uh, taken off some of your time, but um, it, yeah, the, the first point that um, immediately grabs my interest is the adoption of best-in-class tools. It's not a big question, it's yep. just... You keep on saying best in class, Dropbox, Panopto, then that opens, obviously, the, the debate, as in why, why Dropbox, why Panopto and not Echo? What do you mean by best in class? Criticism. Of I course, think. yeah, because it's, it's, it's subjective, isn't it? Um, but best in class is best in class for the business school right now. And for, for, right. for, for us, um, most of, we, we, we asked our faculty, and most of our faculty had a Dropbox account, 97%, in fact, already had a Dropbox account, thus... That's our best-in-class technology. It might be replaced in 12 months' time by uh, some, some new cloud service. And if it does, the system is, is, is an integrator and it's very thin. Therefore, it could respond to it. And with Panopto, um, it, it, is, it is actually, I probably shouldn't say this, but it's actually better <laughs> than Echo in terms of how, how quickly it can encode and turn around. And we don't need um, these big hardware boxes in every single room. It works on the client's machine. It means that we can have it in every, every lecture theater that has a lectern has got the ability to actually capture. Um, so for us, that is a best in class. Um, I, might, I might then, in that case, maybe just misunderstand the best in class. Okay. What, because, because it seems a really big point then that people are already using X and moving them onto something else, something institutional is a difficult thing. It so really is, yeah. the best results from that, I think, because then you're not trying to get them to learn a new technology or a new system. You say, you already use that, now continue using it, but yeah. it will give us this result. We've got, we've got some time if anyone wants to ask anything. 
Yeah, more comment? Yeah. Do you um, run any multiple choice tests and that kind of thing? I assume there's no grade book. How do you do that? Um, we do, so um, this is, a, this is a bit, for us, um, maybe not a best in class, more of a, a lessons to learn. And that is, um, when we were in version two of the hub, we still use Blackboard for um, quizzes and for assignment submission. And we wanted to stop using the institutional VLE because it was the idea of, of authentication was quite problematic. You had to move from one system into another. Uh, we, we chose to use um, a piece of software called Respondus because um, it, it, it gets a lot of good press. It, it seems to be a very solid and good system. Um, our um, findings of that were that it wasn't very good. It was quite archaic and the interface was very difficult to use, although integration with the hub was very easy. Um, so about halfway through using that, we decided to move to um, Question Mark, which is another commercially available MCQ engine, and that is now integrated into the hub uh, through single sign-on. So if you want to create an MCQ, you go new MCQ, it takes you into that environment, and it's fully integrated. So the students get this nice one um, interface, but it just kind of goes through and they have, all, they have so many different question types, it's, it's really powerful. And on the question mark, do they get reports on their performance so they can see, you know, on certain topics? Yeah, 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 and we have, yeah, the, 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 sorry, the my grades, I forgot that part of your question. Yeah, so we have my grades as well as in there, so that, that pulls it automatically through in some of the my grades. And it displays it to students in two ways. They can do it at course level, where it'll give them their, their results at course level, where they can see exactly their progress. But also they can go into the program level, and they can see their results across their entire program. Um, and it'll just it'll give them, you know, their results, uh, submission, assignment, MCQ, however. Um, so it works quite well. And that's fully integrated between the two systems. Um, regarding the cost of the thin VLE, mm -hmm. you said that it costs less than the monolithic VLA. Yeah. How come? Why is um, that? Because, one, because firstly, um, most of the things that we're using are commercially available and free. So things like WordPress is free to use. We don't change that. We don't um, alter the code base at all. So every time WordPress puts an update out, we just update it. And they do that quite a lot and quite regularly. So that's good for us. There's no cost there. Um, the plugins we developed with a third party um, that gave us the functionality that we require. That's a one-off cost. So once it, once it exists, it's done. Um, the, the fees for our development um, when we first developed version 2, which is this idea of upping the scalability, for development um, was about £20,000 all in. And the design, uh, which kind of makes it look cool, which I think is a, a big factor of just making it look nice and, and kind of a nice place to be, um, that was a company, um, and that was probably about like, fifteen to 18000 all in. And they're, they're one-off costs. You can pay those again. They're done. And the idea of this agile development is done via a maintenance contract with the people that did the, the assets for us, and that's around £8,000 per year, and they'll do up to six days per month for development. So any ideas, bugs, fixes, changes that we need, we just say, can you make that change and then make it for us? And that is infinitely less um, than the cost of a, a Blackboard um, setup um, per year. Um, and, it, and it gives us way more development opportunities than submitting something into Blackboard and hoping that they'll make that change in the next service pack we can actually just make that change ourselves. So it gives, or it gives us the first bit of a greater de degree of control. Can I just add, because you're LSE, right? Sorry. Just, just to add, for the LSE people, this is in comparison to having Blackboard or the, what used to be WebC or yeah. WebCT, whatever, not Moodle. All oh, right, okay. But <laughs> <laughs> we also have a monolithic one, but ours, Moodle, is, is free and um, open source as well, so you could also. We did, we did, when, we, when we first um, started doing the development and we needed a, a platform, um, that the, the, the base level CMS, of course we considered Moodle um, because it is open source and it is free. But it's also, it's, it's, the, the actual background design of the PHP is so bad that to actually use it would be very difficult. So our decision, again, this idea of best in class was to go with um, WordPress because it's very easy. If there's the entire API just to build on top of it. It's so much easier than trying to unpick if you make a change here. Where else is it going to make a change in Moodle? Um, that was a personal decision, and that's a personal opinion, but it's one that um, we're happy with. Hi, another question from Twitter. Um, Martin Hawksey asks, uh, are, were there any problems with updates to WordPress uh, breaking plugins? Nope, not at all. We, 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 we made a, we, right up at the beginning, we made a conscious decision that we weren't going to change, we wouldn't do anything that changed any 
of the, um, the basic code structure of, of WordPress. And sometimes that means that you have to be more creative with the extension. But as long as you don't make those changes, actually updating it is very straightforward. Um, but that's also covered by the maintenance contract. So before we do that update, they run checks to make sure that it won't have any impact. And then we, we, we run the update. Okay, so what, what we're just thinking, we've got quite a few LSE people here, um, and we're thinking maybe it would be quite interesting to hear what you think, have a bit of a discussion. Next year as well, but what, 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 what you might think of how this system compares to something like Moodle that we've got, because obviously, you know, that is an open source VLE. Um, do you want to take a, a minute and have a think? And mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah? Well, um, so I, there's quite a lot of chatting going on here in the room, a lot of uh, interest. We've put the hub back up on the screen, and I think Mark's going to just sort of say a few more words, and then perhaps we'll, we'll kind of go around if people want to share something about what you've been talking about. I just, so want to not, I just want to say one thing about scalability. When I was speaking about it, I was thinking about a single owner, i.e. we own it and scale it up. I don't think that's feasible for the reasons I gave, but I think... Um, if we were to make it commercially available, that you could download WordPress, add these plugins, find your output files for your institution, then you could be up and running in something similar quite quickly, but then you'd have to maintain it and grow it yourself. Um, I think that's the, when I was speaking about scalability, I don't see it ever being a Blackboard or a Moodle, because <clears throat> it's not commercially viable in that sense, because it's, it's very bespoke, and you have to put effort in to get to where you need to be. And there was a lot of effort in the background working with the key stakeholders to get us here working with the library, working with the central, working with the, the, the comms team to get this where we are. But it is possible. This is proof of it. Um, if you want to take a different direction, that is more bespoke. Um, it is possible. And that's basically the idea of our innovation, is uh, a thin uh, VLE. Okay, so have we got anyone who'd like to volunteer to share what they were talking about in the groups? Yeah, Chris? Hi. I've just got a question. For those of us who are stuck with Moodle, are there any bits of this that we could integrate into Moodle? Well, it's a good question. Um, and we, we have some... Um, one, of the, one of the biggest things that we've found um, that people like, and I'm not surprised, is the Dropbox aspect. Because it is very easy just to drag and drop files, and there's no denying how, how nice that is. Um, the, API, the API that we wrote is very simple. It's maybe ten lines of code that then displays it in a pretty fashion. And we've, we have actually made that available to the rest of the college. And what people tend to do now is, and I'm aware that this is going out live, <laughs> what we do is we create a web page that hooks up this API, and then within Blackboard, we just create a new web link. It web links to this, and then faculty drag and drop, and it appears on Blackboard. Um, and that works, and that's already there. And if anyone's interested in that, we're more than happy to share it. It's very straightforward to do. You just create a web link inside Blackboard, and then just drag and drop your files, and they appear. It saves you having to log in. It saves you having to figure out how to attach files. Um, it also means that you can edit them. Blah, blah, blah. All the things that everyone hates about Moodle and Blackboard, and it's kind of fixed by that. So. Um, the other thing I want to know about the, the social media, mm -hmm. could we put that into Moodle? The, the feed is actually um, slightly more difficult. Um, just because of the nature of, uh, of, of the fact that this is, this, is where, this is why we use WordPress, because WordPress is driven by communication. Um, Blackboard and uh, Moodle both are not driven by that. It's just a sub, the, the announcements is just a subsection of that. So to bring that to the top and then integrate that with social media, I don't think it's possible without writing um, code. Sonia, do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've speaking a lot, but I, I was just um, suggesting that we talk a little bit about it because, of course, immediately we are thinking as as um, um, learning technologists, like how we, like it, it just obviously sounds very attractive. But we have to bear in mind that there is some some kind of some things that we are losing. Obviously, you know, all the the advanced um, features in Moodle, for example, like assignments and, and that kind of you know. Uh, yeah release of, of certain things and blah, 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 blah. But you already said this. And um, I, I just find it actually the one thing that's fascinating, 
fascinating is that we do now realize that most VLEs, whether they're commercial or not, whether they're expensive or not, they're quite bloated. They have so many features, they're over featured, yep. and we are constantly frustrated that nobody actually uses them properly. Mm -hmm. So there is something very tempting about, yeah, let's go back to the thin thing. And then I just realized, for me, that's the real journey back to where I started when I was a learning technologist the first time around. We just had loads of things. You mentioned question mark, which I hadn't heard um, for it's you know, been seven, <laughs> exactly for seven years, but I used to. Well, of course, you, you just do your quizzes and then you have them somewhere. It's just up. Yep. And then Moodle came along. It was fascinating. Now you can have it all in one big room. Mm -hmm. And now the room is really bloated, and we all want to get out of that room again and back to. <laughs> to you, you, you have raised a really good point, and, and it is a tension point, and it's one that we're acutely aware of because it's really nice that we're, we're getting a lot of our development driven by faculty and by students. But every time they suggest something, it gets us one step closer to being back a monolithic VLE. So you kind of think, mm, you've got to keep that tension point right. So it, it is an interesting point, and this is one of the things about scalability, that if you try and do every single job, before you know it, everything has to be in. So you can select from all those different and jobs. And then why wouldn't you have it in exactly. a big box as opposed to, and that's called Moodle. And that, exactly, and then you're back to, back to where you start. So yeah, it's a very fine line. Um, yeah, go on. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about is uh, the number of students that you have. Mm -hmm. Because I can imagine a university with a lot of students, these places are going to get really busy really quick. So firstly, is it robust enough? Yep. And secondly, what would you do with a course that's got 450 students? Mm -hmm. That's going to be a crowded, horrible page. Um, or do you leverage it in some clever, cool way? Well, the, 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 the newspaper is driven by the faculty, not by the students. So in that respect, there will only be as many posters as that faculty member wants but to the publish. Yeah, it, 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 well, I'll give you an example <laughs> where, where we, we tried to do um, a forum discussion um, by uh, the hub and without any sort of real criteria, and we had nearly 2,000 posts very quickly. And that's quite difficult for the faculty member to actually manage and go through that. How um, students assimilate that amount? Yeah, it, it, does become too, it does become quite difficult, um, and it's something that we haven't quite solved. Um, you know, I think what you need is a rubric, and you need to put conditions around how you, you, you use things if you're going to go to that sort of level. Um, and uh, we, we don't know all the answers, um, but what we, what we have, we, we're happy that we get an engagement, and it's a tension point of how you actually then focus that engagement. Um, I don't know. I'm just asking, so that, let's see, I'm involved in mm -hmm. sites where there might be 150 students following a particular course. We, ha we, we have, uh, we, our, our, our core courses um, have around 200 students. Uh, and, and, and it's robust enough to handle that. I mean, the actual server it sits on, um, it's, it's, it sits on one server, it's got a backup server, and it's got its database on another server. So it's very fast, um, it's very efficient, it's got load balancing built in, and uh, that's all taken care of by our ICT people, and they manage that for us, and that's really, really good. Um, one of the things that we um, plan to do in a, in a future release, which is what I was talking about, future, um, with um, more blended and online, <clears throat> we'd like to introduce the ability to chat straight within here in the same way that you can just chat straight in Facebook, where you just pick it up and start chatting to someone. As soon as you do that, the amount of bandwidth you need to store that information, what's happening, just jumps to a crazy amount. Um, and we're discussing that with... Um, as a baseline, imagine we're going to have 10,000 people all chatting at the same time. Can you do that? And that's our starting point, to try and give us something like future-proofing. And they haven't got back to us yet on that. But there are other solutions, and this comes back to this idea of just going somewhere else. If you want that sort of infrastructure, then um, Amazon Cloud can give you that in two minutes, and they've got the best load balancing, but they can just take how many students or people you can throw at it, and it'll just respond without any delay. Um, so you could go external quite easily. We could move um, the hub from, from the Imperial server to any server in you know, an afternoon. So. Not that I'm suggesting that we would, but what I'm saying is if you wanted but to upscale you, it. If you, for example, had a, a, class, a, a, a course with a, a, a uni that had 8,000 students, mm -hmm. you would just put this on a bigger, more robust server. Yeah, that's it. That's all you need to do, just add more resource to it. And that's, it's very simple to do. Uh, all Imperial servers work on VM, so the virtual machines, which means that you could, they're so agile, you can just keep throwing things at them until it stabilizes and can handle it. So. Just Scalability in that respect is not an issue. No, that's fine. In, in, let's see. Lots of different systems. So we have uh, um, LSE for you, and we have Moodle, and we have this. And so the students are looking at maybe six or seven different things and different sources. So uh, did you ever think about running this in parallel with a VLE? If you have to have an institutional VLE, but less of it? 
Um, I don't think, I think for us that's probably not possible. But, but this is basically looking at six or seven different systems, but it's just displaying them in one interface. Um, and that's just using output files that our current systems have. Um, but to, to shoehorn that into um, Blackboard Learn, which is our institutional VLE, um, just simply isn't possible because we don't have access to the background API to, to integrate it. We just simply don't have that ability. Um, Moodle, on the other hand, it does have way more flexibility. You can do basically what you want with it. Um, but like I um, spoke about before, it's actually quite, in my experience, and then the development team that we have in the background, it's quite difficult to, to edit that code without creating more problems. So updating it becomes more of a challenge. And then before you know it, you're kind of stuck in a moment in time. You become less agile, less responsive, making those updates become much more difficult tasks. And you're more likely to then have to do risk analysis before you make those changes to make sure that everything still works for all the different people that are using it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we chose not to change any of the core code of WordPress. So then we've got a stable um, base that we can just work with. Okay, well, I, I think we'll, we'll kind of maybe take the rest of the discussion offline now. And uh, it sort of just falls to me to thank you, Mark, very much for... One last thing. I was actually going to say, if anyone does want access it, access to it, just to have a play with it, just give me a shout. I've got some business cards I can hand out, and we can give you temporary access um, to a couple of the program areas, so you can take a look in more detail and more depth at how it all kind of is put together. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That, okay. Thank you very yeah, much. No worries. So, if you could just join me in thanking Mark for a really, really interesting, thanks. but also very kind of interactive, I think, presentation and dealing with a lot of questions. So, that's fine. thanks yeah, very no much. And also, just, just one final thing, um, this is obviously our last Network Dead of 2013. Um, our first seminar will be in January, on the 22nd of January. And uh, we have uh, Sylvester Arnad, who's coming from Coventry University, on the 22nd of January. He's going to be talking about uh, games, learning and beyond. And he's from the Serious Games Institute at the University of Coventry. So if you're interested in that, then check out the Network Dead web pages and uh, book, a, book a, your place uh, quickly. I think it's going to be popular. Okay, but thanks very much, yep. Mark. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.